Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about knee functional anatomy. All right, so the knee complex is made up of the femur, tibia, fibula, and patella. Uh, so the articulations include the tibiofemoral joint, of course, that's the hinge joint between the tibia and the femur, uh, the proximal tibiofibular joint, so the articulation between tibia and fibula, up on the superior or proximal end of the two bones and the patellofemoral joint where we have the patella that is gliding along the femur during flexion and extension. Um, so all three of these joints share one large joint capsule which is the largest in the body. Um, as we discussed in the last video, the hip is the strongest and most stable. Uh, but the knee is the largest. So size does not make anything stronger or more stable. Uh, it just is larger, but the hip certainly is stronger and more stable. Uh, the tibiofemoral joint is the hinge joint of the knee. So it is the joint that is responsible for the flexion extension of the knee. Um, it also has small accessory movements, like a little bit of medial and lateral rotation and anterior and posterior translation. Um, so those are really arthrokinematic movements. We're looking at the movements um, at the small level between the bones in the joint instead of um, orthokinematic movements where we have the whole bones moving. So instead of looking at the whole path of the bone, like at the flexion extension, we can look at the roll, spin, and glide. Those are the arthrokinematic movements that are happening inside of the joint, uh, one bone against the other. So flexion and extension um, is the action of the tibiofemoral joint. But if we look inside of the joint at what is happening, we also might see a little bit of medial lateral rotation and anterior and posterior translation. Uh, accessory movements are limited by ligaments to maintain a close articulation and as much stability in the joint as possible. Um, so this, these bones are not super congruent uh, just in terms of how they're shaped. Um, and so it's really important that we have inert structures like ligaments and the joint capsule uh, that are helping to maintain the stability and strength of this joint. Um, so, of course, we're carrying our whole body weight on the tibiofemoral joint and have very high forces going through these joints during running and uh, jumping and all kinds of different activities. Um, so the ligaments must be strong and the joint capsule must be strong to limit these small accessory movements against or during those uh, high forces. Uh, so we also have the menisci that help with that too. Um, meniscus is singular, menisci plural. Um, they're fibrocartilaginous pads like we have in many of our joints throughout the body, um, but in the knee, we specifically call them menisci. Uh, they have lots of functions. For one, they help to improve the joint congruency, which is really always true of fibrocartilaginous pads, regardless of what joint we're looking at. Um, so they help to improve the joint congruency so the bones fit together a little bit better. Um, they disperse joint forces over more surface. They improve shock absorption. Um, they contribute to inert joint stability, which I talked about just a minute ago. Um, and again, what I mean by that, the inert stability, um, the structures of the joint that are inert are the ones that are not producing force. So we have the contractile tissues, that would be the muscle and tendon, and then we have the inert structures, all of the other structures of the joint that are not producing force. So the joint capsule, the ligaments, the meniscus, the bursas, all that. Um, so those are the inert structures, and it's important that they be strong and, and functioning correctly so that they provide um, inert joint stability beyond the contractile joint stability that's uh, supplied by the muscles and tendons. Uh, they also function in proprioception uh, because we do have receptors in the menisci that sort of act like force plates. Um, so they're in the menisci and they're detecting force just like we have receptors in the skin and in our flesh uh, that are detecting pressure and detecting force, we have those same receptors in the meniscus that help us to detect how much force is going through uh, the joint. The screw home mechanism is 
an interesting function of the knee. Um, so when the knee is in flexion and it's beginning to extend, as it's approaching full extension, the tibia has to externally rotate by about 10 degrees for the condyles of the femur and the tibia to line up correctly. And we call that the screw home mechanism. Um, so that's just the normal movement, the normal function of the knee is that we're in flexion and as we're approaching full extension, the tibia rotates 10 degrees for the condyles to align correctly. Okay, the proximal tibiofibular joint uh, is actually functionally influenced to a greater extent by the ankle than the knee. It is still affected by the other joints in the knee because they share a large joint capsule together. And anytime we have more than one joint inside of a joint capsule, one joint function will affect the others because if there's inflammation or damage to structures or anything like that, if they're all sharing a joint capsule, they'll all be affected. Um, but with that said, um, the proximal tibiofibular joint actually is, is very much affected by the movement and function of the joints of the ankle more so than the movement and function of the other two joints of the knee. So an ankle injury could potentially lead to um, injury or dysfunctional movement of the proximal tibiofibular joint. Uh, this joint is only capable of gliding movements to accommodate ankle and knee movement. Um, so again, it is a synovial joint. It is sharing a large synovial joint capsule with the other two joints of the knee, uh, but it is a gliding joint. All it does is glide to accommodate the movement happening in the knee complex and in the ankle complex. <clears throat> okay, the patellofemoral joint is the relationship between the patella and the femur. It is another gliding joint. Uh, the patella, like every sesamoid bone, its job is to improve the mechanical advantage of the tendon of the muscle that it is embedded in. Um, so this is no exception. Uh, the patella improves the mechanical advantage of the quadriceps to allow greater force production during knee extension. Uh, the inert tissues of the knee complex, so as I've mentioned, we're talking about ligaments, joint capsule, meniscus, etc., are important for structural support and control of force transmission in addition to the contractile tissue, so that would be the muscle and tendon of the joint. Okay, so the knee is not inherently congruent. So it's not like the hip where we have a real ball and socket where they fit together pretty well, they're fairly congruent. The knee, we really just have the femur sitting on top of the tibia. And we have very large forces and a lot of mobility. And so it's important that the inert structures hold the joint together as best they can and that we have contractile tissues that are also functioning um, not only to their fullest extent, but also with a, an appropriate force production relationship with one another um, so that we maintain the balance and an appropriate function of the joint. Um, when we have imbalanced um, force production of different muscles of the knee, that's where you end up with like um, the patella tracking laterally and, and all sorts of different issues. Okay, knee movement. Uh, function of the knee complex depends on the function of the foot, ankle, hip, and trunk. Um, of course, we know that, that the regions of the body and the joints of the body all tend to depend on movement elsewhere. Uh, but the knee is affected more than other joints, um, regional interdependence, we've talked about that before, um, but the knee is, is affected by the neighboring um, segments more than any other because it has so many biarticular muscles that cross it. Uh, so as we know, biarticular muscles um, have advantages and disadvantages and the disadvantages would be passive and active insufficiency. And considering that we have all of this list of muscles here, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, biceps femoris, rectus femoris, plantaris, gastrocnemius, sartorius, and gracilis, that is a lot of biarticular muscles. That is most of the muscles that cross the joint. Um, it's really with the exception of uh, the other three quadricep muscles, but almost all of the muscles that cross the joint are biarticular. So that means that 
um, movement at the knee is going to significantly be affected by movement at the hip more so than most other joints. Uh, so passive and active insufficiency affect the range of motion of the acetabulofemoral and tibiofemoral joints. Full range of motion and full contraction cannot be achieved in both joints at the same time. So there's a significant trade-off between movement at the two joints and some amount of trade-off between movement at the knee and the ankle because of gastrocnemius and plantaris. All right, so on to the ligaments of the knee. Uh, the collateral knee ligaments. Uh, collateral ligaments are always on the lateral and medial side of a joint, and the knee is no different. Um, in the case of the knee, the collateral ligaments are extra articular, meaning that they're outside of the fibrous capsule. Uh, the medial collateral ligament is a primary medial stabilizer that pr primarily protects against valgus forces. So a valgus force would be one coming from the sides, coming from the lateral side and making an impact in that direction that would cause kind of a medial angulation of the knees and that would be a valgus force. So if we had an angulation in the medial direction, the medial collateral ligament would be the one who's trying to resist that force and try to keep the joint together so that there isn't a, a rupture or a break in that direction. Um, so the medial collateral ligament is a primary stabilizer against that type of force, which also means it's the one that would most be injured by an excessive amount of a valgus force. Uh, the lateral collateral ligament is the opposite. It's primarily protecting against varus forces. So that would be a force coming from the medial side angulating outward. Um, and it prevents external and internal rotation of the tibia on the femur. Uh, the lateral restraints are stronger than the medial restraints out of necessity because large varus forces are placed on the joint during normal gait. Okay, so in just normal gait, we have large varus forces that go through the knee. Um, and so our lateral restraints are much stronger as a result. So although in terms of injury mechanisms, we're more likely to experience a large varus force um, because we're more likely to have a force hit us from the outside than from the inside of the knee just by virtue of what most athletic activities are like and, and so on. Uh, but via our normal gait, we are going to have higher varus forces. So with abnormal gait um, or an injury during gait, like a running injury or something like that, then we might be more prone to um, a lateral collateral ligament injury. Okay, the cruciate knee ligaments are in the middle of the joint and cruciate like cross, they make a little X right in the middle of the joint. Um, so they are intra-articular, meaning they're inside of the fibrous capsule, but interestingly, they are outside of the synovial capsule. So this is a really rare case. In most uh, joints of the body, the fibrous capsule is on the outside and the synovial capsule just immediately lines the fibrous capsule. So all the structures are either inside of both capsules or outside of both capsules. In this case, if we look at this bottom picture here, the blue dotted line is showing where the fibrous capsule is and the red dotted line is showing where the synovial capsule is. So as you can see, it is immediately inside the fibrous capsule for a lot of the joint for the medial and lateral and anterior portion of the joint. Um, but as you can see posteriorly, instead of just you know, following the same path as the fibrous capsule, it has a big dip, not really a dip. <laughs> it is a big inlet, maybe that's the word, uh, but essentially the, the synovial capsule goes, it follows the condyle and goes all the way inside and then comes back out and follows the condyle again. Um, so the cruciate ligaments are actually attached to the tibia in that sort of inlet. Uh, so they're actually between the fibrous capsule all the way in the posterior and the synovial capsule, which went all the way in there. 
Okay, so although the cruciate ligaments are intraarticular, they're not inside of the synovial capsule in this case. <clears throat> the anterior cruciate ligament stabilizes against varus and valgus forces and against anterior translation, internal and external rotation of the tibia on the femur, and hyperextension of the tibiofemoral joint. Okay, so because of the way it's positioned right in the center of the joint, it's able to um, guard against or resist lots of different types of forces and lots of different types of movements. The posterior cruciate ligament is much larger. Uh, it also stabilizes against varus and valgus forces, but it's also the primary stabilizer of the knee. It's much larger um, and so offers a lot of stabilization. Uh, the PCL limits posterior displacement of the tibia on the femur and external tibial rotation. Um, so a, a significant injury mechanism for injuring the PCL, it would be like a, a strong force to the shins, like a really hard kick to the shin, for example, that would cause the tibia to displace in the posterior direction um, could uh, damage the PCL. Uh, the PCL is stronger and more than twice as wide as the ACL. Uh, so there's a couple reasons why we hear about so many more ACL injuries than PCL. Um, for one, the PCL is much stronger than the ACL. And two is that the ACL is also guarding against lots of different types of um, forces, lots of different types of movements. And those are exactly the types of movements that in the extreme would cause it to be injured. Okay, the iliotibial band or the iliotibial tract, uh, it's an extension of the tensor fascia latte and gluteus maximus muscular fascia. So if we look in this picture here, you see gluteus maximus there. And then where it ends on the lateral side, you see all of that white, that is all fascia. That is the gluteus maximus fascia. Um, and then if we continue looking in that direction and we look around to the tensor fascia latte on the anterior side, it also is continuing down and ending in the iliotibial band. So there's all of that fascia that's coming from all the way at the top of the, the iliac crest there, coming all the way down and where the gluteus maximus comes in and tensor fascia latte comes in, then we start to call it the iliotibial tract. So then that tract goes all the way down the whole lateral side of the thigh, crosses the knee and inserts into the lateral leg. And of course we mean lateral leg anatomically, leg being the, the region between the knee and the ankle. So it's going in on the lateral um, leg <laughs> beyond the knee, um, going into the fibula and lateral condyle of the tibia. Okay, thank you for watching and I'll see you for the next one.